a starring cast, reliving the past, and making basic run fast. It's January 1985, and this is Yesterzine. Time rolls on, doesn't it? We are perilously close to our first 40-year-old magazine on this show now, and that's not surprising. The spectrum, and thus the entry of mainstream computing in the UK, is about to hit 43 years old, and magazines weren't far behind. In 1985, chief amongst them was Your Spectrum, the magazine that would a year later evolve into Your Sinclair, almost exactly as it became clear that virtually no one would care about any Sinclair machine that wasn't the Spectrum. (coughs) As we hit our unfortunately timed Christmas issue of YS, there's much to look at. The first new Spectrum since the Spectrum is about to hit the shops, much earlier than I'd previously assumed. And your Spectrum are not convinced Sir Clive has this one right. Automata may have invented the interactive movie about a decade early, and with the already rising price of software, Cascade may have a solution with a problem that there's another solution to that also has a problem. We'll explain. But first, we have a premiere to go to. The interactive movie, depending on your taste, possibly the scourge of the early 1990s. Titles like Night Trap were innovative, sure, and even with the video quality of the time, had graphics way beyond any title that had to calculate the visuals itself. With the massive storage possibilities of up to 650 megabytes instantly accessible on a single disc, massive sprawling epics became possible, and this show has long contended the change from having to account for every byte to being essentially unrestricted on storage, is possibly the one true instant shift in gaming. But you might note we're not talking about 1993 here, mainly because of the two minutes I just spent talking about early 1985. If you owned an arcade, you might have come across the barely interactive Dragon's Lair, but that still relied on large optical discs. And the gameplay just consisted of playing a video which you could very occasionally interrupt, much like Uncharted 4. This is your spectrum. We've got 48 kilobytes, or about one twelve thousandth of a CD. And yet, Automata tried to jump the interactive movie gun by a decade with Deus Ex Machina. There's no full motion video, of course. The graphics are going to be the responsibility of the spectrum. Instead, there's a second cassette, containing what I guess is technically full waveformy audio. Let me explain. You load the game on your 48, and it has to be a 48, and there is a little preamble to sync the tape and the game before it instructs you to start properly. When you do, you get this. Tuesday evening. After tea and compulsory prayers. The last mouse on earth tried to hide from mankind inside the machine. Just before it died, as the nerve gas eased its sphincter. The last ever mouse dropping caused a slight accident. You may control the progress of this accident on my behalf and with my permission and lead it up the telepath. I put you so in molten spiral which must not stop spinning. The gameplay is simple in most cases. In this screen, the theory is apparently to stay on the DNA stacks to keep them moving while avoiding the single enemy. You wouldn't know this without help though, the manual offers no information whatsoever about gameplay, and everything that happens in this is going to be absolutely batshit. Which is fine, because while you'll be getting some sort of score, I don't think it's actually possible to lose as such. Where they're actually going with this, we learn a bit later. All the screens a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one person in their time plays many parts, their acts being seven ages. Those condemned to a grammar school education will recognise the seven ages of man from Shakespeare's As You Like It. And maybe this is what they told the cast, because it includes John Pertwee from Doctor Who, 
comedy legend Frankie Howard, and punk pioneer Ian Jury. The game will continue to essentially follow this defect throughout its life, and synced to the tape it will have a fixed length of about 46 minutes. Some of the sections have a little bit more game. Towards the end of side 1 you'll find yourself trying to repel attacks in the interrogation zone in what is basically the world's simplest port of Tempest. The game will never use more than the four direction keys, although in some cases diagonals are possible. But I'm not sure they're going to make any of this make any kind of sense. Using my strapped together capture approach of an mp3 rip and a copy of the emulator Clive it does drift slightly out of sync during this playthrough of side 1, although I don't think that's affecting my understanding. There is a better method though, because there's a remake using the original media and based on the Spectrum version. That's just 4 quid on Steam and I highly recommend that over doing what I did. It includes a high res mode and a director's commentary, which I presume is pretty much just going to be the reciting of the drug shopping list from Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. I'd ignore both to be honest, because you transport this into the present day and it loses all impact. I've been joking about drugs and insanity but that really is the impression you get from the high res version. I only suggest the Steam version at all because it's easy to run and sync correctly. As an experience, and I think that's what you have to call it, if it has any impact at all it needs to be viewed in the context of 1985. Before Night Trap. Before Seventh Guest. Before anything like Res or Detroit. All of which I suspect owe it a debt. But why have most of us never heard of it? Well for a start, your Spectrum don't review it. I suspect they had no idea how. They describe it as being closer to a concept album with a story and they're not wrong there. Automata themselves apparently called it an animated televised fantasy. If it had a problem it's a 45 minute show off game and it cost £15, comfortably double the price for a AAA blockbuster at the time. Creator Mel Croucher would later regret this, the price mostly driven by overly fancy event packaging rather than the costs of the product itself. This combined with it being so very different to anything around at the time made it a hard sell. Even more so since it never made it to shops and could only be bought direct from the publisher. Thus sales were low and the number of bits of losable and breakable components mean that the few copies you'll find on eBay are going for the best part of three figures. We're going to see a lot more on how this is not yet the games magazine it had ultimately become, but if you want a preview illustration, on page 55 Dave has disassembled the entire game and reviews the source code. It does explain how it uses a method normally used to play music to, ironically, keep it in sync with the music it cannot hear, and also that a perfect score is in fact entirely impossible thanks to maths. Your Spectrum tap out with a description of it as potentially an interesting chunk of computing history, and that I can completely compare with. Those who did review it struggled. Home Computer Weekly gave it 100% across the board according to Automata's advert later in the issue, but everyone else just attempts the predictable waffling about experiences and cult followings, including, somehow, Barry Norman. It also promises Amstrad and Commodore 64 versions, of which I believe only the latter ever happened. £15 in 1985 is silly money, but if you're any kind of a student of computing history you probably owe it to yourself to drop the £4 in 2024. There's even a remake sequel available too, released simultaneously with this remaster and the last released work of Christopher Lee. I'm not sure I'll bother though. Deus Ex Machina is a groundbreaking achievement of its time, but like all groundbreaking achievements those that stood on its shoulders did it better, and attempts to resurrect it are likely to work about as well as any on that mouse from the start of the game. It's striking how different this issue is. Compare a 30 year old copy of PC Gamer to a recent one and they're not that different. PC Gamer was always full colour, the basic style is similar. You wouldn't be confused by which one is which, but they are clearly basically the same thing. Your Spectrum is only another 8 years back, but it appears to come from an entirely different universe. It's black and white mostly, it reads much more than a generation behind. 
by PC Zone or Omega Power or anything from that era, gaming and computing were broadly established. Ten editions into YS, everything was still new. They had a phone helpline, they had type-ins. The review section was crammed into a tiny portion of the magazine and was presented as an analogy for a TV series jukebox jury, presumably since they didn't know how to review games yet so cheated and swiped an approach from other media. We'll get there soon though because we're going to need to step through this to show what a strange old world it seems to be from. Even the cover promises a mega basic offer, something which would scan entirely differently these days. The first advert though, surprisingly futuristic. Having been surprised at a wireless controller a couple of months ago in a super play from 1993, it turns out Cheetah got there eight years earlier with their patent pending remote control this is clearly a prototype joypad. It shares the big flaw with its younger twin though. IR communication is going to mean missed key presses, especially as the Spectrum's limited expansion options lead to the transmitter being plugged into the back, where it appears to be three times the height of the machine. Automata were apparently not the only ones being optimistic about prices they could charge for games. Legendary £1.99 budget publisher Mastertronic had a new adventure game, Wrath of Magra. It's not £1.99. It's not even the six or seven quid you'll see other full prices go for. It's £12.50, and it doesn't even have John Pertwee. YS didn't review it as far as I can see, but CBG were on hand to give it three out of ten, and the fulsome praise, the graphics can be turned off, a pity the boredom cannot be. One indication of how different things could sometimes be is cheat codes. Take Chucky Egg, a classic little platformer to be sure, but a difficult one. Infinite Lies would make a difference, but you can't just type a silly name like Fluffy Kiwis. You need to poke a value into memory to make it immediately quit when loaded, then poke another in to sort out the lies. This is exactly the kind of thing action replay carts would later automate. The article explains that instead of fixing the lives counter, it just skips back into your game at every game over, which is a neat way to do things. This kind of technical access does have other advantages too. The article has a much more involved listing that adds joystick support to the game. The first in a series of interesting ads. These days, people remember their rubber-keyed Spectrum with extreme reverence. But in 1994, it appears they couldn't wait to be rid of them. We're going to see a lot of these replacement keyboard cases and they're not cheap things. To fit what would be generally recognised as a keyboard to your Spectrum back then would cost £65 plus VAT from Idasoft, who would at least do the labour for you. They also offered that ultimate add-on for any computer, a power switch. I'd laugh, but I've run a lot of Spectrum stuff on a Raspberry Pi, which, 400 model accepted, is also missing one. If Idasoft's full service case replacement is too rich for your blood, AMS will do you one for £50 at the unquantifiable cost of it looking bloody awful. One of the more remarkable services your Spectrum offers is that for the vast majority of the workday two days a week, TechBod Pete would just take calls from readers with problems and try to solve them. That's nearly half an employee worth of time for two thirds of a page of magazine. Astoundingly, this survived right into the Your Sinclair era too, without being horribly abused by people just calling him up to complain, or claiming to be called IP freely. Pete also had a spot on the then London-only Capital Radio, where he was running a competition to win an Amstrad, much to the chagrin of the editor. Oh chaps, the next year or so is going to be rough. The warranty story next door speculates that Micro Repair Club's maximum extended warranty of five years would be sufficient because who knows what will be around in five years. You know what won't be? Sinclair. If you remember the prototype Amiga Power that YS eventually turned into, adverts for assembler and debug boards stand out a mile too. Apparently, a novice will be writing assembler in minutes. So long as that's several thousand minutes, I can believe them. It was a strange world back then. Most people know one of the big places to buy your games in the 80s was Boots the Chemist, but they were by no means the only weird name. This advert for Firebird's new budget range looks compelling, but the fact for 2024 readers to note is that Firebird were a division of… BT. Who would have thought that? A division of BT selling computer games, 
What an impossibly stupid I... Oh. Oh, never mind then. The story about BT setting up Firebird is a few pages on, along the side of their end of year biggest turkeys feature for worst games of the year. Transylvanian Tower, the 1984 winner and a game I've made a note to never play, is just beaten for the title of worst game by... Leftover turkey drumstick roll please. Jet Set Willy? Wait, what? I don't think this is like that review we saw a few episodes ago where the writer claimed platform games were played out several years before Sonic. It's just bollocks. The article itself doesn't mention any of the games in the actual list and I'm wondering if Nick was handed the job at 3pm on Christmas Eve and just grabbed the game that was top of the charts, with its predecessor closely following it up. The chart is strangely static. The game between them also has a sequel due, although of course that kind of thing took four months rather than four years back then. Some good stuff dotted through the charts though, notably my first 3D driving game love, Checkered Flag, entirely unrelated to the Atari games of very similar name, which is probably for the best. One of the things that's remarkable about the period is both how things require chunky external upgrades and how many of those were available. The machine may have been barely £100 at this point and even with inflation that's a decent price, but if you wanted to do about anything with it, you were plugging something else that cost money in. Most obviously, loading tapes. But say you'd spend more than the price of a computer even on a basic printer, it's costing you an extra £45 to plug it in. Don't want to open your specy? Cheetah will upgrade your already near useless 16kb machine to 48kb for another 40 notes. Feeling ambitious? And Watford Electronics will take 400 quid and sell you the pile of electronics needed to use tiny capacity floppy disks and printers with the added side benefit it'll make your machine look like a toddler entering world's strongest man. Want to use a joystick with games that don't support it? Rainbow have you covered for just three times the price of a new release game for what is now the freeware application Joy to Key. I mentioned back on Deus Ex about the seismic shift being limited memory and storage to not really worrying about it, and nowhere illustrates that point more than the programming tutorial for the issue, where standard base 10 numbers take up too much space, so Ian has to save a grand 2 bytes on each of his numbers by adopting a weird base 255 numbering system using the entire Spectrum character set. If you don't understand any of that, then that's exactly my point and this is a page of what would eventually be known as a games magazine. We wouldn't see such madness again until the last issue of the zombie the one from Amiga games inexplicably threw in the first part of an Amos tutorial they would never finish. Other things we'd never seen in a modern magazine is a guide to hacking the copy protection out of software, but that's precisely what your Spectrum are doing here. They briefly cover themselves with a not illegal honest section, with an excellent but don't use this method of pirating software to pirate software disclaimer. To its credit, it's interesting. The first part focusing on how to break into the basic coded loader programs most games needed in order to start the loading of the machine code actual game, but which thus contain clues on where all the good stuff would eventually be. As the guide itself points out though, to do anything useful you're going to need machine code yourself. If there's one thing that strikes me about all the adverts in this issue, including the printer interface and disk drive ones above, is how much of it is simply businesses that are completely invalid these days. For instance, we come across two products that are now just Wikipedia, specifically a database of football results for the last half decade, and a directory of plants that can give you the name of a specific flower in only just over a minute and for only about 30 quid in today's money. They're undercut by the competition though, because Vega's Vegetable system allows you to plan your vegetable garden and revenge for that pun for under 7 quid including that. It took me a while to see that because of the advert for Leonardo, the most advanced spectrum graphics package. Care to guess what standout feature makes it more advanced than Paintbox and Melbourne Draw? Nope, it's lines. 15 minutes we spent looking at how different 1985 was and I should just have told you that straight line was a luxury feature of your drawing package. A tutorial on YS Mega Basic is probably a bit more dodgy though, because as the name implies, YS Mega Basic was the creation of the magazine, 
and only available from them for 8 quid, making this more a paid for user manual than a useful piece of magazine for most people. Effectively, it's an advert page, and the reason I know all this is the next page is literally an advert page for it. I say 8 quid, it's the full tenor if you don't have tokens from previous issues of the magazine. Which brings us neatly to the previously teased section where we review games. All five pages of it. Games are marked, confusingly, both as hit or miss, and out of five, and they don't correlate. Delta Wing is both a hit and a miss from different members of the jury of three at three out of five. Roger somehow manages to call Beachhead a hit and give it two, despite the multiple misses scored three. It's probably a good thing we don't restrict ourselves to the top and bottom games on this show these days, isn't it? Working out which ones they even are could take the entire episode. The nearest thing to consensus is Pajama Rama, the second of the Wally games, where Wally has to sleepwalk in order to find the key to his alarm clock so he can set it and wake up on time. And they say games aren't art. I'm not sorry to be missing awful looking full price Pac-Man clone Beecher either, and spoiler alert, it's not even our last legally distinct pill muncher of the episode. I am though tempted to give Braxbuff a try at some point, which Roger, 2 is a hit Willis, gives a full 5, but Dave, 3 is a miss Nichols, gives 1. In a world where only one person did a review, this game would have very different fates. No time for that though, because Transform will sell you a keyboard for over 70 quid, but it does at least come with a microdrive interface, power supply and switch. An advert catches my eye. All or Nothing promises 3D graphics in a manner that tells you such a concept was a huge novelty. This is going to be something really special. Luckily, my good mate Seb of Seb's Place has played this one. Uh, 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 oh. We mock, as well we might. All or Nothing got reviews perilously close to the magic 73% on release and killed the publisher. But when this very magazine compiled a top 100 ever at the end of its life, this was third. Then again, number one was the thinner than a 5p carrier bag death chase, and the article was written by someone now most widely known for having awful views on everything. So maybe we don't pay too much mind to that. What does Seb think? This game can uh, go f off. No eBay, no internet, so as was be the case for at least another decade in these magazines, there's a classified advert service although I note they've not yet hit on the wheeze of charging for what is basically free content for a magazine. Most of them seem to be swaps rather than people selling things, although there's no suggestion that's a rule. I'm going to call out Clive Snelling of 40 Kelso Close though. 450 programs to swap. Yes, I'm sure absolutely all of those are 100% legit. Perhaps having dealt with Clive before, Chris a few adverts down feels the need to insist on originals only, just next to a strategic advert for blank cassettes. Speaking of writable storage, and while being thankful there isn't an Oscar for Segway of the Year, Digitex claims to be able to double the capacity of your microdrive. Given microdrives are the second least reliable storage method of all time, only losing to putting down anything in my dad's house and turning your back for half a second, removing all its error correction does not feel like the smartest move. If you can't afford one of those fancy replacement keyboards, Marvic Marketing has you covered with the Games Board, an attempt to turn your entire machine into a joypad, but really an attempt to turn a cheese grater and a few rubber pads into a £10 product. Apparently, it can improve your scores by up to 50%. I suspect this hinges on naught being a kind of up to. Compatible with all games and software except presumably the ones requiring more than 10 keys or the ability to know which key is which. Another programming section next as four readers again do the work of the editorial team. To be fair, some of these are useful or clever, the most interesting being Robert Stockton's legally distinct Moonlander clone, Luna Buggy. But if you think I'm typing in 7,000 lines to find out then you're going to be disappointed I have a man for such things. In the meantime, can I interest you in yet another keyboard case? Glossy wipe, like your mum. And easy material, much like that joke. Speaking of easy material, your Spectrum will sell you a t-shirt for a fiver, making a point of saying it supports 16kb owners. 
making it about the only thing in this issue that does. If you are one, Fox can solve the problem by sending you an upgrade. And if you already have 48 kilobytes, how about a keyboard to replace that grubber keyed wonder everyone apparently always loved and was in no way a bad idea from the start. Anyway, nearly done here. Just time to look at the closing advert gallery in which Saga are offering some kind of add-on keyboard case for the Spectrum. What a novel idea. Transform's microdrive storage box adorably claims to store a total of up to 1.6 megabytes of data since it has room for 20 cartridges. They should get together with Digitex and claim it's 3.2 meg. Having totally condemned all piracy multiple times, most notably when they were showing you exactly how to do it, YS say the quiet part loud by allowing multiple adverts for products literally described as tape copiers and making it very clear they'll handle all the tricks games use to stop software like this. The number of companies making a business of repairing machines that were at maximum 18 months out of warranty is a little concerning too. And so we're out of magazine, which is good because we're just in time for me to pay off a running joke while making a semi-serious point. I'd better win a BAFTA for this. If there is one thing people remember the Spectrum for, it's the little rubber keys. If you ever get it appearing in some kind of tedious Do You Remember The 80s show, then that is the thing they will mention. The first issue of the current incarnation of Retro Gamer chose it as their thing to highlight on the cover, granted while well, just in search of a slightly PG-13 pun. But here's the thing. They made the Spectrum in various forms for almost exactly a decade. For three quarters of that time, it had what, for these purposes, we'll call a proper keyboard. And we've just seen that apparently the market for those two years appeared to consist almost entirely of replacement keyboards. Sinclair had clearly noticed. The Spectrum was unleashed on the world on St George's Day 1982, 23rd of April. Magazine deadlines being what they are, despite this review being in the January 1985 issue, we welcomed the new machine in October 84. This is the Spectrum Plus, a machine that, despite logically having to exist in order for the later Plus 2 and Plus 3 to make any sense at all, most casual observers have never seen and possibly don't realise exists. The Plus gets a fairly cautious welcome from your Spectrum, and that's probably not surprising, because technically, it's not a leap. The board is somewhere between basically and literally identical to the contemporary original machines to the extent that your Spectrum and my technical consultant Yawning Angel think it's likely impossible for software to find out which one it's running on. It's still 48 kilobytes, although unsurprisingly, there's no 16 kilobyte variant this time around. In an interview later in this issue, Sinclair Research MD Nigel Searle leaves the fate of the rubber key in the air, including the 16 kilobytes, despite admitting that no retailer wanted to stock the thing anymore. The Plus was already outselling the original 2 to 1, despite the fact that everyone loves the rubber keyboard and totally weren't all buying keyboards that cost nearly as much as the machine in order to escape it. In reality, the decision had likely already been made, and the non-plus machines were formally discontinued early in the new year. This was slightly controversial, since the machine cost £180 compared to the previous theoretical entry price for a Spectrum of £99 for the 16 kilobytes, and £25 more for the useful one. To be fair, it still compared favourably with the £200 C64 and the even more expensive CPC-464. The early adopters were punished though, as when they stopped making the original, the Plus was reduced by £50 less than six months after launch. To their credit, your Spectrum asked the obvious question. What about those makers of add-on keyboards people were buying because they were so happy with their iconic original design machines? Nigel dodges it by claiming they'll be fine because of all the existing machines in the world, at least three of which presumably hadn't already been upgraded. He also suggests they were going to sell the plus cases, so these people, who already knew how to make cases, could offer the exact service they were already offering but now they could pay Sinclair to do it. They were wrong anyway. It didn't kill that industry. It exists to this day thanks to hardware YouTube godfather Lee Smith. He's produced more than one batch of his gorgeous replacement case, the Mectrum, and is currently considering another. There's a link in the description if you have a 48 and are tired of typing on Barbie doll corpses instead of keys. Go convince him. 
To be fair, it seems likely that 1985 people will start wanting to replace the case on their Plus machines. Your Spectrum reported that their review sample, a machine you'd think the manufacturer would take additional care on, was already producing false keystrokes when pressing the J key. Unfortunate, as that's an essential to make a pre-Amstrad Spectrum load anything from tape. This was important. Planet Sinclair report a near 30% failure rate for the machines, thanks to an unfortunate tendency for the keys to fall off. If nothing else, you have to credit Amstrad for creating spectrums that basically worked, and didn't leave bits of themselves behind if you moved them to a different room. On an extended back page, two items we didn't have time to cover fully, but that's okay because it's already been done better. In the world of 1985, people were worried that games were getting more expensive. £6 full price had become £8 and soon £10 led by Ultimate's Mega Games. And of course our star game this month cost a wallet mangling £15. We pray for a hero to save us from ever escalating game prices and provide us with real value. The monkey paw curls up a finger as on page 20 we come across an advert for Cassette 50. 50 games on one tape for just a tenner, including postage. That's just 20p a game. There are red flags. For a start, given that most games took 5 minutes to load, you might query how long this tape would have to be, and the answer is you'd need a C250, which I don't think exists. There's also the review quote, where apparently the most upbeat thing they could get anyone to say about any of the 50 games is someone describing Frogger as incredibly frustrating. Lovely. I also noticed Frogger wasn't on the list of the 50 games in the advert until I worked out they inexplicably printed the list from the ZX81 version and not the Spectrum one in your Spectrum magazine. Funny we should mention Frogger because Spectrum Computing reveals that's a former type-in from the unrelated Your Computer magazine a thoroughly fascinating tome we're going to need to cover because I've just been distracted by it for a solid hour from showing you page 56 where a game called Spectrum Cross is what Cascade copyright defyingly retitled as its obvious inspiration. The existence of it as a type-in reveals a secret. It's written in Spectrum Basic, and while there's only one more magazine type-in, that appears universal. Well, about half are, what we'll call original releases as the lawyer raises a Vulcan-like eyebrow, the rest come from two other sources. A previous 50 game compilation from UTS, from which I am absolutely sure they have taken only the best, and astonishingly, the entire contents of a Sinclair Research 4-pack called Games 1. The biggest red flag though is the collective sigh you'll have heard from everyone with a retro gaming YouTube channel because Cassette 50 is a well-known cack pile of a compilation that's been lazy content for almost everyone. And while I'm lazy, I'm not lazy and entertaining enough that you'll sit here for 50 individual instances of why the bloody hell would you play this? So let's just illustrate with the very first game on side one, the original release, Muncher, which gives itself away by just dumping you in basic when it's finished loading. On playing, it's a pretty good typing, if it had been a typing. And playing it gives us time to skip two pages ahead in the magazine, where H.E. Hammond from the sunny resort of Luton writes in to pick up on an issue with a listing supporting the Zip Compiler, a lovely product which, with some restrictions, can take a basic program and convert it to speedy machine code. The mistake would have been infuriating. A lowercase l that looks identical to a 1 and located in the middle of a giant listing where you would easily expect to see a 1. Nonetheless, this would have given me an idea. Since we have these ready-made arcade games all typed in for us, maybe we can improve them and convert them to use the zip compiler. I say would have, because we already have a man for this. What host Snorkers already did? Exactly that. And I invite you to click that video at the end of this one because it's remarkable the difference that can be made to this or anyone's creations with a bit of legwork and some quality work with the green screen. And whisper it, but I'm not sure that last bit is actually strictly needed. Maybe one day I'll take a proper look at C50, but I'm already inclined not to be as hard on it as others. 
I make retro computing videos, so of course I work in IT, and was previously a programmer. And it will shock you not at all to know I got my start with a ZX Spectrum. Although it was a plus two, so I don't have to pretend to like the rubber keys. Shut up about the keyboard! Fair. The point is, I'd have enjoyed these for what they were aged six, but I'd also have probably enjoyed digging into them to potentially improve them somewhat. It's probably why I enjoy a Snorkers video so much now. And while it was a semi-expensive pack, I'd have got more out of ripping apart these 50 games than I'd have got from any two full price games you could name in 1986. Playing them in 2024, I can see why people mock this compilation. In isolation, there's no special reason to play any of them, and I probably don't need to make it explicit that you can play better versions of Pac-Man, Frogger, Breakout, or whatever the bloody hell this thinks it is. But it's not as such an awful collection. It's just not the quality of commercial releases that would have cost from 10 to 50 times as much per game. And even now, if you want to piss about in basic, these would be a fine starting point. Unlike much of the YouTube community, I respect Cassette 50, but like them, I'm going to do so from as far away from it as possible and content myself with watching Snorkers try to turn the flawed muncher into something special. And for something equally special, not a guarantee, join us the last Friday in February for another magazine. What ho!